heard about the news story where folks are feeding cattle Skittles. Yeah. So this is, of course, horrible. Cool. Who would feed a cow Skittles? But here's my question to you. Why are we feeding this to our children? Okay. So, uh, so all of you are here because you believe that grass is the most biologically appropriate food for cattle. But yet, what I've discovered is that a lot of people who produce food don't seem to also then think about what might be the most biologically appropriate food for humans. So for the first time, obese people outnumber underweight people in human history. So clearly something's going on, right? And I could go through all the numbers about type 2 diabetes and heart disease, where we've never been sicker as a population ever. And so what I'd like to propose to you guys here is to put the mask on yourself first before you can help others, okay? So as you're running around trying to take care of your animals, you need to be healthy and you need to be taking care of yourself. And you're going to be a much better uh, caretaker of your animals if you're taking care of your body as well. So what will the future diet be? What are we being told? We're being told to eat less meat, eat chicken or fish instead of red meat, eat more plants, eat more grains, everything in moderation, including Skittles. Um, don't eat that. Lab meat is the answer. And uh, an indoor plant production under 100% artificial light, which also drives me crazy. Okay, did anyone see Before the Flood? Um, yeah. Um, so it was a documentary put out by Leonardo DiCaprio. And there's a really interesting scene where he's standing in front of a cow eating some grass uh, with a nutrition expert who's telling him that we need to stop eating so much beef and just switch that out with chicken. And if we only did that, it would make such a huge impact on our health and the environment. Like, how wrong is that? What do chickens eat? 100%. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that's one of the messages. And then, of course, that high meat diets are just as bad for you as smoking. All right. So I'm here to dispel that myth. Um, I am one of the few dietitians that actually feels that meat is a good thing. So as you uh, as you see people who you know are up up the scale and in, in healthy food, red meat intake tends to be you know less and less according to mainstream media advice, nutrition experts, and I am an outlier. So, uh, lab meat, the future of food, this drives me crazy. I just saw another post that China's really going into this too, and then Impossible Burger just got a $75 million infusion on top of the millions they already had. A lot of this money's coming from the tech world, and it's really disturbing for me because they're, they are the future. Google is the future. And they've got a lot of money, and it's just so misguided. And what they're not realizing is that you can't make something out of nothing, okay? So where are you going to get all the inputs to make these lab burgers compared to capturing solar energy? So we've got rain, sun, fertilizer, more biodiversity, sequestering carbon, and yet we're being told that a field of soy is more environmental. And, uh, uh, oh, I thought I had a different slide here. Okay, so what can we learn from our past? And I just want to kind of go through a few traditional cultures and uh, illustrate to you that there's many different foods that humans can eat. So there is no one perfect diet that we can advice to the entire public, but there is, I believe, a framework of a type of diet that works for people, okay? So when we look at the Inuit, their classic diet is seal, okay? Not very little vegetables, and they've done very well on that. 
And then we've got the Maasai in Kenya, and they eat also very little vegetables, mostly milk and blood, uh, herding population. And as you can look at the terrain here, kale probably doesn't grow very well in this environment, nor, nor in the Inuit environment. But then we've got the Katavas, uh, 75, uh, 70 to 75 percent starch from roots and tubers. So is it really the carbs that are the issue, or perhaps something else? And are we sick because we can't moderate? Are we just morally flawed people that just can't seem to get it right? Okay. Uh, here's a great study, and these charts on the side are illustrating that the more someone likes a food, the more they consider a, mo a moderate amount, right? So the more they like pizza or cookies, the more pizza and or cookies were okay to eat, right? And they were always doing better than whatever their perception of moderate was. So and if you think about an alcoholic, this could be easily applied, right? How many beers are okay to drink in a day or a week, right? And the fact is that modern processed food is also addictive. Um, and so this study is showing that moderation messages are unlikely to be effective messages for helping people maintain or lose weight. Right? And there's some really strong reasons for this. These are the reasons. Okay, these are all the foods that we're not seeing traditional cultures for thriving eating. Okay, this is the problem. Hyper palatable processed food which is not biologically appropriate for humans to be eating. And here's another recent study that just came out from Harvard Business Review. We don't like to cook anymore. And I think that's really important as producers to understand and, and nutrition educators to understand. Um, the reason why we're seeing so many meal kits on the market is not because you know, they're taking over and taking away your business is because that's what people want. They don't know how to cook anymore. They don't know what to do with the whole chicken anymore. And I celebrate the people who do cook from scratch, I cook from scratch, but I think we need to adjust our expectations a little bit of our consumers. And I think there's a lot of different ways sustainability can work for different people. Um, so, you know, maybe it is taking some of your products and, you know, partnering with the vegetable CSA and maybe processing it a little bit, maybe cutting up some of the broccoli and cutting up some of the meat and offering a stir-fry kit. Maybe it's something like that. But making it easier for people is an important thing because not everyone is going to buy a half side of beef, dry it for four hours, and then thaw and cook it all from scratch. It's just not a reality of most modern people today in society, unfortunately. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying that's what's happening. Okay. And we can also see that between 1982 and 2012, we're spending twice as much on processed foods and uh, 10, uh, actually it's more than 10% less, but we're, we've gone from 31% to 21% uh, on meat. So we're spending less money on meat, more money on processed foods. So this is a really interesting study that came out, and it's sort of the basis behind um, Rob Wolf's book, Wired to Eat. He couldn't come, but I got to plagiarize some of his slides for this presentation, so he's here in spirit. Uh, but basically, there's a lot of stuff going on in our brain that makes it so that we don't have an off switch for certain foods. Okay, we are wired to seek out the most nutrient-dense foods, which served us very well up until just a few hundred years ago. All right. Um, one of the most interesting pieces is palate fatigue. So it's really hard if you're just eating, let's, let's take the Inuit seal. I doubt that there's a time when they're like, oh my God, this seal's so good. I just can't stop eating it, right? That's the <laughs> But we can all probably identify some food that we have no off switch for. So for some people, it's ice cream. For me, it's potato chips. Um, and so, uh, what's going on there? Well, there's some really smart people working in labs making sure that you can't eat just one. So, you're not morally flawed, it's just those guys are really smart, okay? And that food is really unnatural, and it's bypassing our natural satiety cues. 
because it's so hyper palatable. Okay, it's really hard to overeat roasted chicken and steamed broccoli, right? It's really, really easy to overeat ice cream and mac and cheese. So boredom is built in. Palate fatigue, sensory specific satiety, and monotony are assured the consumption of a varied diet. So that's the reason why we like to have a huge variety because it, it ensured that we got a lot of different nutrients from a lot of different things that our brain was seeking out, you know, more than just this one fruit. Um, so, and then we've got the, again, these modern foods are designed to bypass our natural satiety signals. They can be habit forming. Um, a lot of them actually light up some of the opiate receptors in our brain. There's a lot of chemicals going on. Ding, ding, ding. This is a good food. Uh, but it's really hard to overeat boring food. And so to illustrate um, just how powerful the um, boredom palate fatigue thing is, I have a little video to show you. And less than a quarter of the kitchen sink remains, but it's melted down to an unpleasant oh. wall. It's getting really, really hard. Okay, you can turn it on. I got this soupy, puddle of saddle colored water. That's good. So, what we missed here actually, we were, we were having a hard time getting this thing to show, and so I told them it started at a certain point. But see the fries right there? Just a second ago, he had hit a wall and he couldn't eat any more ice cream. And so he went ahead and ordered a plate of fries. And as soon as he started eating some fries, he got a little uh, variation in there. He was able to go down and win the competition and finish the ice cream. So my fault for telling you guys to start so late. We were, we were trying to figure out where to start this video because we had to pull it up on YouTube. Anyhow, so that's a professional eater trick if you're ever in your, you know, <laughs> eating contest. Maybe bring some hot dogs with you on the side just to kind of mix up the, the uh, saltiness and everything. Okay. So, there's always room for dessert, right? And picture an all-you-can-eat buffet. You want to try a little bit of everything, right? Um... And even for those of you who have kids, you're very aware of the dessert effect, and you're probably aware of the dessert effect even on yourself. You can be perfectly full, satiated from a meal, but there's always room for a slice of pie, right? Um, and then uh, this is a post that I wrote here, Why Won't We Tell Diabetics the Truth? So diabetics who are basically allergic to sugar, effectively, um, type 2 diabetics, they don't even want to hear it. They want to... If this is what sells magazines. You can have your pie and eat it too, right? And another really important thing we have to think about is timing. And so this is a new phenomenon that's really happening. In addition to people not liking to cook anymore, we keep our kitchens open 24 hours a day these days, all right? So there's a huge difference between they've looked at, you know, different studies. They've taken 2,000 calories and a, you know, eight-hour window, you know, just eating only during the day, close that kitchen at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, versus 24-hour access, the same amount of calories, 24-hour access, 24-hour access people gain weight. The ones who have the restricted food window don't. Okay, so that's my first piece of advice to everybody, just close that kitchen. Don't eat late. And when you eat late, uh, it's much more likely to go on to fast storage. So I'm just going to take you through what I do in my day-to-day -day nutrition clinic. I see mostly the people that come to me are both overweight and have some GI issues. And so I just kind of thought that it might be interesting for you to see. So we've got Ashley, 34-year-old obese woman, uh, had PCOS and an IgA deficiency. Uh, frequent colds and infections because of this IBA deficiency. It's like an immune deficiency. Um, gurgly stomach, uncomfortable all the time. Her doctor re recommended that she try gluten and dairy-free, which is pretty unusual, actually, for a doctor 
She had been to diet, the dietitians before, but always felt bad because all they did was talk about portion control. So that's what I was taught in, in my training, was just to kind of show someone on a plate what's an appropriate portion. But as I went through earlier, that's just really hard for people because that food is just way too delicious. And there's really smart people making sure that you can't have portion control. So she actually broke down crying in my office. She had hit rock bottom, bottom and she was trying to save herself, only 34 years old. So here's what I did. I wanted to let her know that I was on her side. I'm not the diet police. I understand how she got into the situation. It was not her fault for being in this situation. If you're not, you know, really overweight and sick, you're, you're kind of not doing American right. Okay? <laughs> These foods are designed to trigger you to overconsume, so you're not bad or weak. We can fix this. I'm not a believer in tracking calories. I don't think that that works. I don't think it's natural to have to enter numbers. Um, you won't be hungry, and I wanted her to get tested for celiac disease too. So I was pretty sure, just based on her symptoms, that that's something we needed to rule out. My goals for her were to reverse insulin resistance. So insulin is a storage hormone, and clearly her body uh, was resistant to these signals. Um, so I wanted to support her liver, liver and gut healing. I chose a high-protein, low-carb, gluten-free, dairy-free diet, multivitamin, probiotic, and something called berberine, which can really help with blood sugar regulation. I have this really cool app where all she has to do is take a picture of every meal. She doesn't have to enter it, but she is a little bit of, you know, I'm, there's someone watching. Um, just a photo, though. Um, check in with me every two weeks to 30 minutes, so most dietitians will say, portion control, okay, see you back in three months. So I'm calling this the 30-day regenerative reset. And for any of you who are looking to maybe try a new uh, diet or you want to lose a little weight or maybe even fix some tummy problems, this is a great place to start. So uh, unprocessed foods, 100 grams of protein a day. So that's not 100 grams of steak by weight. That's 100 grams of protein. So those are two different things. Um, and I'll go through what that could look like in a little bit. Focusing on cellular carbs, so not acellular, not things that have been pounded down like flour and pasta and bread. So fruits, vegetables, roots, and tubers. Don't fear fats, not seeds, animal fats. Aloe is awesome. Keep the meals pretty boring. So roasted chicken, grilled steak. I, that may sound boring to somebody who, it, you know, is used to eating a lot of processed foods. Grilled steak sounds very exciting to me. Um, but to just keep it so it's not hyperpalatable, because we're really trying to readjust your taste buds here. So no grazing. I want three regular meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, at least to start. Some people can go with two or one meal a day. Other people realize, you know, maybe five meals works better for them. But just to start out, three meals a day, regular whole foreign food. Uh, kitchen closes at seven. Sleep eight hours a day. That's a whole other presentation. But you could be eating the most perfect diet, and if you're only sleeping five hours a day, there's nothing that's going to help you with your overall health. Um, sleep is absolutely critical. And then for her, walk 20 minutes three to five times a week. Um, obviously, we want to move more than that, but she was incredibly sedentary. So, and usually, when you tell someone to walk 20 minutes, they're out there for 20 minutes they feel pretty good and they'll keep on going. So if you, if you keep that goal small, they'll, they'll usually just keep on walking a little bit longer. Focus in on protein. So when you compare the protein to, um, in animal products versus the protein in plant products, animal products generally win. Um, so you could get 30 grams of protein, which is what I recommend per meal, from 137 calories worth of fish or 700 calories worth of peanut butter. So for those of us who are not looking to increase our caloric intake, animal products win. <clears throat> but notice eggs are a little bit, it's, they're actually not as high protein as some people think. 
that was a little bit of an eye opener for some people. Um, that's still awesome, but it's the fat that's really driving up um, the calories. But I'm also very, very pro fat. This is just an illustration on how to get good protein. What does this look like? I eat eggs every morning. Three egg omelets with some vegetables, a huge salad with an entire can of tuna or salmon, leftovers from the night before, something like that would be awesome too. Pop some avocado in there for some good fat that helps slow down digestion. Um, just lemon and olive oil for dressing. Uh, dinner, four to six ounces of meat. Potato or sweet potato. I try to tell people to think of like a June cleaver type diet, like a 1950s type diet. Totally awesome way to eat. And then for snacks, keeping them lowest carb and kind of high in protein and fat. So we've got meat sticks, it's jerky sticks, olives, hard boiled eggs, veggies, things like that. If people just stick to this and they're on, they are transitioning from a more standard American diet, this is fully satiating. They're not hungry in between. They're getting complete nutrient density from a, a diet like this, and it's just really satisfying. And so instead of focusing on what you can eat, I like to have people focus on what they can eat. So if you just pick a protein, pick a vegetable, pick a fat, an herb and a spice, and if you don't like chicken legs with peppers, avocado, cilantro, and chili powder, you don't have to eat that again for another 100 years. Right? If you think of all the different proteins you have out there. So, uh, so instead of feeling sorry for yourself that you can't eat the pizza or, you know, whatever it is that you're missing, just focusing on the huge variety of things that you can eat from sort of the perimeter store or from your local farmer. So I'll follow up. Um, her IGA was negative, uh, for those of you who know anything about celiac testing, but um, her other markets were positive. Her doctor said she didn't have celiac. I said, go find another GI doctor who did confirm she did have celiac. Um, so I'm not technically allowed to diagnose that. Uh, she's no longer hungry all the time. Her stomach no longer hurts. Everything is normal, no more bloating. 15 pounds gone in a month. Self-confidence back, motivated, and we'll totally stick with it now. So moving from the regenerative reset into a more sustainable diet, um, I recommend, you know, once you do sort of a, a reset where you're really paring down to just like meat and vegetables, slowly work in some other foods, see what works, come up with a template that works for you, 80-20, so some people are, you know, really clean during the week and then maybe on the weekends they might have a small bag of chips or a little slice of pizza, you know, just to live a little bit in modern society without feeling so restricted. But in general, really sticking to that 80% uh, template of a really kind of whole foods, meat and vegetables type diet. Your food cravings and sweet tooth will vanish. Blood sugar swings, headaches will go away, and your vitality will be restored. But aren't I trying to kill you with all this meat? Right? Um, there's... A lot of studies out there vilifying meat and comparing vegetarians to omnivores. What most of those studies are looking at are vegetarians to standard American diet. There are really big lifestyle differences between these two populations that aren't always accounted for. So vegetarians tend to be more likely to do things like yoga, maybe not smoke and drink as much. Um, and just eat more vegetables in general than someone on a standard American diet, right? Um, but when they've done studies where they've looked at people who shop at health food stores, so generally the same type of lifestyle, they found no difference at all in overall mortality between people who eat meat and people who don't eat meat. And we've got this study that came out not too long ago, so where they adjusted for all potential confounding factors, so those confounding factors are things like smoking, exercise, all of that, no significant difference in all cause, cause mortality between vegetarians and non-vegetarians. No reason at all to eliminate meat from your diet. So what are the benefits of red meat? Red meat is my favorite of all meats. Um, it's the most satiating macronutrient protein we're not eating enough. Uh, red meat has tons of vitamins and minerals, especially B12 and iron, which are really hard to find in other meats. 
And of course, healthy fats and saturated fats will not kill you. But then when you go out online, it's really confusing and you see things like this showing that uh, you can get all the protein you need from broccoli. Okay? Now, what they were doing here is comparing two ounces of beef to two cups of broccoli. Okay? First of all, second of all, they got their math wrong because uh, there's actually 21 grams of protein in beef versus 3 grams of protein per 100 grams of weight. Oh, sorry, and 100 calories of beef has 13 grams of protein. 100 calories of broccoli has 7 grams of protein. So they were wrong. They were wrong. Okay, so let's walk through how much protein do we need? I thought this would be a really quick little blog post. I just thought it was like kind of an interesting question. And I opened up a huge can of worms that actually spanned over four, like, 3,000-word blog posts because this was a really interesting question. So I went back and I looked at how did they even come up with the recommendation of 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. Have you guys all heard that one, 0.8 grams? Not so much. Well, uh, that gets translated to 56 grams of protein for men and 46 grams of protein for women. But what they're not realizing, uh, what we're not realizing is that they're doing that calculation for us because Americans don't know kilograms and we don't know how to multiply. So uh, they just went ahead and did it for us, and but they based it on the um, reference woman of 125 pounds and a reference man of 154 pounds, which is pretty much nobody, right? <laughs> So the 0.8 grams per kilogram is actually just the minimum amount you need to avoid muscle loss. It is not the optimal amount. So when you think of, you know, recommendations for vitamin C, that's generally assumed to be the optimal amount of vitamin C. For protein, 0.8 grams per kilogram is the minimum. So, so 56 grams for men and 46 grams for women is the minimum for these skinny people to avoid muscle loss. But of course, the CDC has different numbers. What, what are the average weights? 195 for men, 166 for women. So I know how to do math and can make the conversions. That's 71 grams for men, 60 grams for women. But again, that's minimum to avoid muscle loss. I don't want to eat the minimum. Plus, steak is good, right? But I want to see, you know, what happens when you eat more. Uh, and also, there's another set of recommendations called the Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Range. It's actually AMDR, but that wrong. Uh, which is 10 to 35 percent of calories should be from protein. So if we went really conservative on that and said, okay, 2,000 calorie diet, 20 percent protein, that's 100 grams of protein a day. And this is a government recommendation too. I didn't make this up. And so that's double what they're telling folks when they say that it's 56 grams for men and 46 grams for women. But when you look at your package, um, packaged food, and it shows the protein there, and then it shows the percent daily value, that's based on these reference people. There is a lot of research that supports increased protein diets for elderly, chronic disease, weight loss, blood sugar, metabolic issues, athletes, and highly stressed people, which is pretty much all of us, right? We can, one of the, we can fit into one of these categories. So they've tested diets with three, gra uh, three grams per kilogram, so three times the, uh, over three times the RDA, and still people seem to do really well. And again, protein is the most satiating macronutrient. So if you want to feel full and lose some weight, increase protein. But, oh, my God, are we eating way too much meat? So I looked at this number. How much meat are we actually eating? Not too much meat. So uh, when you look at the numbers adjusted for a loss, total meat, when I add up all the animal flesh products, it was actually five and a half ounces per day per American is what is the actual intake. That's not too much meat. That's actually that really low number from um, 20 grams per kilogram that the, we're eating their bad recommendation, actually. We need to be eating more. 
Um, we're eating less red meat than before. We're eating a lot more poultry. We're eating a little more seafood. Look at the salads and cooking oils, and those are not the good oils. Those are, you know, highly processed vegetable oils that are pro-inflammatory. And of course, we're eating a lot more grains. Is that more pearl barley? No. <laughs> um, and we're eating a lot more caloric sweeteners. But can I get all my protein from plants? So here's another meme that I found on the internet. Again, with this 46, this is all we need, women, all women, between 19 and 70, just 46 grams of protein. Is that pregnant women? How about, you know, people that are still growing, people recovering from illness, a bodybuilder? What is this? This is, these numbers are completely irrelevant and shouldn't be recommended to an entire population. Um, and then here they're making it seem that you can do just fine, but... Oh, my little charts. I don't think my little charts are in here. But again, it was peanut butter, 700 calories worth of peanut butter to get 30 grams of protein compared to, again, the um, lower calories in fish and in, you know, meat and chicken. The benefits of organ meat. So I highly encourage all of your consumers, you know, you want to move that whole animal give them recipes for organ meat, figure out how to maybe desiccate some of that liver and put it in a powder form um, for folks that don't want to eat liver, but you could probably still sell it that way. Um, really, really high in vitamins and, and minerals. Um, anemia is the number one nutrient deficiency in the world. We're not going to get there with more kale and more salad, okay? We're going to get there with more red meat. This is what people need. So, especially, you can see preschool age children, 47% of the world's population are um, not getting enough iron. So, meat, uh, beef compared to other meats, and I, my slide's got a little squish in here, so hopefully you'll be able to see it. But overall calories, lamb came up, these are all USDA numbers. Um, lamb came up a little bit higher. Uh, oysters are a little bit lower, but in general, you know, meat is pretty efficient. This is all a three-ounce serving. We've got for fat, overall fat, we've got, um, you know, chicken it, breast is pretty lean, so that's why it's showing a three-ounce serving as a little more protein. Um, okay, omega-3s and omega-6s, so I do want to talk about this a little bit to you grass-fed producers here. Um, Yes, grass-fed beef does have more omega-3s, but I'm going to talk about that in the context of our overall diet and compared to things like salmon. Um, it probably isn't something that we should be leading with as producers as the number one health benefit of grass-fed beef. There's other, there's other benefits, but it's not really in the omega category. This is going to be easily refuted by, by people. So you can see, look at ground turkey. Look at the omega-6s in ground turkey. Okay, and then other nutrients, iron, zinc, and B12. Beef is just really high in these. Um, and then we've got chicken breast extremely low. So um, comparing beef to chicken is a really good one, I think, because chicken is just seen as clean. You're much more likely to get a foodborne illness from chicken than from beef. It's uh, more humane for some reason. Think of a chicken calf compared to a cow out on grass. And then they think it's healthier. And it's actually, you know, beef is similar in calories. It's similar in fat profile and much better in iron, zinc, and B12. So when we look at the omega-3s, I wanted to show on the left we have breastfed beef and on the right we have grain-finished beef. And so even though on the left we'll see that there's more omega-3s, it's 4% compared to 1% in grain finished, it's still not a very significant piece of that circle chart. So again, when, and when we look at um, all the different nutrients in typical beef compared to Grass-fed beef, so for beta-carotene, you've got 5% of your daily value of beta-carotene versus grass-fed 10%. So a difference of that 5% is 
to me is a dietitian, not a significant, like I wouldn't say, oh my gosh, eat fresh grass fed beef for beta carotene. It's not really significant. 3% of your vitamin E comes from typical beef versus 7%. So, yes, it is double, but it's still, that's only 7%. Not significant. Significant, yes, for CLA. So, CLA, there's, there's less than 10%. Uh, of your daily value in typical beef versus 25% of your daily value in grass-fed beef. Um, CLA has been shown to help people lose weight, gain muscle. Um, it's got a lot of really great qualities. Um, but when we look at grass-fed dairy, that's where we really see a difference. So we've got um, one cup of grass-fed milk is five grams of CLA compared to one cup of grain-fed milk at 0.8 grams of CLA. So, and why is that? Well, it's because we're eating more fat when we're, we're taking in more fat when we're drinking milk compared to most people just aren't eating that much fat when they're eating steaks. Now, we should be eating more, of course, but typically people don't. Okay, so when they're eating steak, it's lean and cut. So they're just not getting a lot of fats in general. So say, oh, it's you know, so much better in the fats, well, that would be great if we're actually eating the fats, which I think we should, but we're not. Right, Russ? Yeah. So, when we look at uh, omega-3s in beef versus salmon, in three ounces of wild salmon, we've got 1,200 omega-3s versus 73. Okay, and the ratio in wild salmon is amazing. We've got a, a six to one ratio, and in grass fed beef, it's five omega sixes to one. And this is again, this is uh, USDA grass fed beef, so I know many people have done their own numbers and have better numbers, um, but that's hard for me to make a blanket overall. You know, it definitely is context specific. But according to that data, you would need to eat three pounds of burgers to get the same omega-3s you could get in a three-ounce portion of salmon. So, promote beef for iron, promote beef for B12, promote beef for zinc. Let's just let that omega-3 thing um, just die, die down a little bit. And then, of course, we want to eat ruminants for the environment. Aggressive ruminants are, um, okay, some kind of rough. Uh, you know, I don't have to argue with anyone here. I actually have to take out all my good slides on the environmental benefits. You know, when I go to nutrition conferences, that's what I'm really harping on there. Um, so it's so nice I don't have to do that here. But again, animal welfare, I mean, even a typical cow can walk around and isn't under fluorescent lights and, you know, eating 100% grain on a concrete floor. So, you know, calf or pork and chicken is the worst of the worst. So if folks are like, well, you know, I don't have any money, I'm like, if you're super sick, you don't have any money, and you, you just, you're at the grocery store and there's no grass-fed beef available, just get the typical beef. It's still really high in nutrition, and it's still better for animal welfare and for the environment than this, which should be, which should not be happening at all. And then, of course, we've got the ethical considerations, right? And so we hear that, you know, on this vegetarian hierarchy of what's more ethical to eat, cows are below chicken and fish. And then, you know, you're more pure as you move up. You've got eggs are better. Um, dairy is better than, than eating fish. And then all the way at the top, we've got fruititarians and breatharians uh, who don't need to eat at all because of their purity. Right. So isn't it interesting that, you know, we're trying to get away, we're trying to get more inclusive as a society and, and less, uh, less judgmental, and, and, and yet this is, this is speciesism here, right? But I'm just trying to cause least harm, and I do think that's incredibly noble to try to cause least harm through your food choices, and we all, of course, want to do that. But when you consider the principle of least harm, one grass-fed ruminant that could supply you know, 450, 475 pounds of, of meat compared to how many beans die for that lab meat. 
right? In that big soy field. How many, how many critters died when they mowed down the woods or uh, field in order to clear land to make that field? All the pesticides and herbicides and all the insects killed uh, through that process, the runoff, the fish that are dying from, from the water being diverted from rivers in order to flood irrigate the fields, right? Compared to one steer. So according to the principle of least harm, I think it's actually a more ethical decision to eat a large ruminant. But this is how we relate to animals, right? And this is how we relate to food. And this is how a lot of people live. Right? It's really sad. We're overstimulated and disconnected. We don't even know what's going on. And so a lot of this comes down to worldview. So a lot of uh, the talk this morning was on reductionism versus holism. And, um, you know, are you a materialist or a post-materialist? Is the world here for us to just extract as much as we possibly can? Or is life sacred and is it our place as humans to figure out how we fit within the web of life? We've got materialism, reductionism, humans at the apex. The world was created only for us. Or we are here as part of the ecology of the planet of Earth. How are we going to feed the world? And this is a very long conversation, but I just want to point out that exponential growth is a really bad thing um, and is unsustainable in itself. So this question always comes up every time I do this talk. And, you know, I have a few answers for this, but if I have a three-bedroom house and you're going to ask me, how am I going to sleep 500 people in my three-bedroom house? I would tell you, I have a three-bedroom house, right? Um, there are a lot of humans. We're doubling every 35 years, okay? Um, if I had my notes on here, I, uh, I'm reading a book right now, my Ishmael. Has anyone read Ishmael? Yeah. So, um, fantastic trilogy of books. The last one is blowing my mind right now. But he talked about, you know, even if you colonize Mars, Within, you know, another 50 years, you need another planet at the rate you're going, okay? So, um, our human growth rate is just completely unsustainable. And my other argument is, is what we're doing now working? It's not working. We're sick and we're killing things. We're causing much more harm than, than we should, Right? Uh, so these are really complex questions that, of course, we're not going to answer today. There's been a lot of proposed solutions to overpopulation, which have been incredibly not okay. Um, so uh, it's complex, but certainly saying, you know, because grass-fed beef is only a very small percentage of you know, the meat on the market, therefore, it should be discounted. It's just like 20 years ago, me saying, well, organics, that's just a small percentage of the market that we have kept on. I mean, now look at organics. Um, so keep doing what you're doing because it is making a difference. Um, and then I just wanted to, my last slide, I just want to mention, I'm working on a film um, explaining the ethical, the nutrition, and the environmental reasons why it's okay to eat meat. Um, so if you want to follow along with that, my website is Sustainable Dish Backslash Film. Um, you can get on my newsletter. My regular newsletter is just about weekly emails with news and information, or you can just follow the film. I'll have a crowdfunder going out in the month of December is the plan, um, with production starting next spring. We're going to be highlighting some regenerative farmers. We're going to be talking to people who are really conflicted about eating meat. And we're just going to be exploring you know, the nutrition, the, the ethics, and the environmental consequences of our diet, basically. Um, and I have a book also on the same topic. So I'm really excited about this stuff. I'm really looking forward to it. 
And I really hope that um, that you guys, you know, if you're not well, consider fixing your bodies and treating your bodies as well as you treat your breath that it comes to. Thank you.